Okay, so why don't we get started? So it's uh, our pleasure to have Quincy here. Uh, Quincy, I guess you'll give you know us about half an hour talk about electric era, and uh, is there any questions that students may have? Yeah, so I know some of the students have already applied electric era, so this will be a good opportunity for you to get over with and to connect with them. Okay, perfect. Um, sounds great, and thank you again for the invitation. It's, it's honestly really exciting to be here. UW is an incredible engineering school in general, and especially your guys' um, electronics and computer science program. So, you know, just want to start the conversation with saying that you're doing excellent engineering, you're getting an excellent engineering degree, um, and that's going to really set you up well for, you know, exciting careers in engineering and technology. Um, our company, is, is you, as Bowson mentioned earlier on the call, is Electric Era. We're, we're really focused on, you know, simplifying DC fast charging for electric vehicles with our high power battery technology. Um, our company was founded ultimately because we realized that the future of transportation was electric, um, is, rather is going to be electric. That's, that's pretty obvious. I think when you look at Tesla's $800 billion value cap, um, really what's happening. Like we are fundamentally going through a, a major phase change with transportation and everything from, you know, electric cars for passenger vehicles to, you know, the aircraft of the future, uh, robo taxis, um, ferries, you know, garbage trucks, buses, everything's becoming electric before our eyes, fundamentally because, um, you know, it's a better, better product, in my opinion, uh, better performance, and ultimately we'll have a much lower to total cost of ownership as, as battery pack prices continue to fall. Um, to kind of quantify the, the, the phase change in the growth rate of what we're going through, there's, there's about, you know, one to 1.5 million passenger EVs on American roads today. Um, but by 2030, that's going to skyrocket to 24 million. So there's a huge growth rate happening. Um, and it's, it's uh, you know, quite an exciting time from a CapEx investment of automated, automotive OEMs into this, this production ramp. Um, but Electric Era realized early on that while there's this huge momentum being generated on the automotive OEM side of things, there's really not a whole lot of momentum on the, the infrastructure side of the equation. You know, fundamentally, we asked ourselves and did a quick hand calc because, you know, we founded this companies coming from engineering backgrounds uh, on really how much infrastructure was needed to support the, the daily energy usage of the electric fleet that is going to be on our roads by 2030. And we realized, you know, there's almost 60,000 DC fast charging stations that are needed, but only 4% of them exist. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, and it's, it's quite problematic because DC fast charging stations have a huge, huge power problem. Um, this is this is not a trivial matter. Um, you know, as much of a phase change as we're going through on uh, the EV vehicle side of the equation, we're going through an equivalent phase change on the DC infrastructure, uh, DC fast charging infrastructure. But you know, where you can productionize an electric vehicle um, in a factory and and really get your unit economic so down associated with production costs, you really can't do the same thing. Uh, on the D, you know infrastructure side of the equation because it's more of a manual process. You're building fast charging stations. You're working with utilities and grids operators, which are very bureaucratic. Um, and as a result of that, you have a huge amount of costs creeping into the equation that really makes deploying DC fast charging stations quite untenable and quite problematic. Um, you know, we did a lot of research when we founded this co company, and, and we realized through customer conversations that over 50% of cost comes from power cost alone, uh, and that's for total station lifetime costs, including everything over 10 years, you know, just the power cost of pulling power from the grid and the grid infrastructure installation costs can, you know, constitute 50% of your total station lifetime costs. So major, major monetary penalty here. But honestly, worse uh, yet is the fact that that grid infrastructure can take, you know, one to four years to build out. You know, this is the transformers, the medium voltage distribution panels, substation upgrades in certain cases. All of that, uh, that you know, grid infrastructure is, is really hard to deploy and, and there's major backlogs, you know, it's well documented that there are major backlogs around, you know, the, the utilities that have higher uptake of electric vehicles. And, you know, while most customers just have to wait three, maybe four, maybe two years, a lot of customers just can't get it. You know, we actually have, you know, quite a few customers that, that are, experiencing what I call power scarcity, where they physically can't get the, the infrastructure, you know, the, the grid infrastructure that they need at their DC fast charging station because the local utility won't support it. So huge issues. 
Electric air simply reduces power in half with our battery technology. Um, it, it's, this is a fascinating chart that I love to look at because I, I'm a, a coming, I come from an engineering background. I'm a bit of a nerd, but um, you know, we asked ourselves like at, at the first principles level, why is power so intensive and so problematic at DC fast charging stations? And it really comes down to the native EV charging load profile, which you can see on your screen for a Model 3. So, um, you know, in the, on the left-hand graph, you see a charging power as a function of state of charge. Um, you know, it, the Model 3, when it starts, it, you know, pulls uh, and linearly increases from, you know, about 100 kW to 250 kW for maybe 5% of state of charge. And then it pulls at 250 kW for maybe 20% state of charge. And then it linearly decreases down from there. But this is a bit of an abstraction that really masks the real problem at play, which you can see on your the graph on the right hand side of the screen, which shows the same exact thing, but in the time domain. Um, and, and in the time domain, when you obfuscate it out of the state of charge domain, you can see that this is like a very, very spiky load profile, uh, honestly, a very unhealthy load profile. This is like not a good thing <laughs> in general, if you're a grid operator or are an expert on power electronics, as, as most of you guys on this call are, are uh, becoming. Um, so fundamentally, high power consumption is very transient. And, and when you play that out at the station level, it manifests into what you can see on your screen where you have a bunch of spikes, you know, just a bunch of spikes. Uh, so this is a load profile graph over the course of a month. Uh, this is for a four by 150 kilowatt charging station. All those red spikes are very, very high power intense, short duration and infrequently incurring charging events. Um, and, and even though they are very non-energy rich because they're so short in duration, um, they constitute you know, 50 to 60% of the total power requirements and power consumption um, at this EV charging station site. So there's this very unhealthy balance between the grid infrastructure that has been installed and needs to be installed to support these very, very infrequently used and short duration load transients. Um, and, and really, that's the, the first principles rationale and reasoning for why this is a major problem. Um, the, the economic math, the, the en energy economic math behind all this is ultimately that a grid operator charges this DC charging station as a function of that peak power installation and how much they use on a given month. And again, Electric Garage has simply developed a, a high C rate fastest charging battery to meet that load profile and reduce the power use all the way down, you know, 50, 60% in this case. Um, so we basically realized, oh, this is, a, this is an industry that really has a high power problem. Let's build a high power battery. Um, we, we looked around and we realized there really weren't a lot of industry solutions that could support very fast discharging rates with traditional lithium ion chemistries. And we, we dug into the, the engineering rationale of, of, of why that was difficult and, and not supported. And we realized that Although you can support, you know, at an intercalation level, the lithium ions shuttling back and forth between the anode and cathode matrices for certain cell chemistries, in practical application, you really can't do it because the technology, or sorry, the battery cells get so hot. Um, so we built an advanced cooling, liquid cooling, uh, thermofluidic battery module interface that allows us simply to just reject heat out of the battery cell very, very effectively and quickly. Um, so we have like a very high heat transfer coefficient, if you remember your thermal engineering classes. Um, uh, from the battery cell into the liquid coolant and ultimately from there into the ambient environment. Um, so the end result of that is that we've built, you know, a high power battery that's, you know, uniquely turnkey integratable into the EV charging infrastructure ecosystem. And then, you know, very differentiatedly, it, it can discharge in incredibly fast C rates or high C rates, I should say. So 20 minute char discharges, uh, 20 minute charges, and then very, very importantly, it can do that for, you know, 10,000 plus cycles. Um, that's also uniquely enableable as a result of our cooling, uh, cooling technology. Um, so the result is that we've built a very low cost battery um, by ultimately getting rid of a lot of the battery cells that are traditionally used to support, you know, this level of power. That allows us to lower our cost of goods sold by, you know, decreasing the line item on our bill of materials associated with the battery cell costs. And then it also actually allows us to very, very powerfully, no pun intended, decrease our footprint. So we have a very power dense um, storage product. And, and at this point, you know, we've advanced the technology fairly far along um, and, have, and have taken uh, this all the way through battery module uh, testing. So this is a fun engineering graph that I, I really like to show to folks. 
that shows our um, you know, charge, 1C charge and 3C discharge for our battery technology. Um, so you know, just right there, it went through a discharge and you know, our technology allows us to suppress temperatures to only an eight degree Celsius temperature rise, which is incredibly low. Um, but honestly, more importantly, we're, we're able to do this in a way that where we've solved the thermal gradient issue with traditional lithium ion or with traditional liquid cooled systems, you have, you know, the slug of fluid moving past your heat generating batteries slowly heat up over time. And that actually creates like a thermal gradient along the length and along the width uh, in certain cases um, that causes differential cell aging because your cells are at different temperatures. And that's a bit, that's a major problem. So in addition to you know developing this advanced cooling technology, we've developed it in a way that allows us to uh, you know solve that fundamental thermal gradient problem. Um, so kind of putting that all together, really, this is like the enabling technology that we're now you know building into our first battery pack and ultimately going to be deploying into the field in Q3 of this year. Uh, that really solves these fundamental core first principles issues in uh, the the DC fast charging market. Um, so I'll go ahead and pause there and let folks jump in with or questions, um, but just kind of wanted to give you guys kind of a primer on what we do and why we're doing it. Um, so feel free to jump in with questions at this point. Any questions, guys? Uh, feel free to ask questions. Hi, can I ask a sorry. Go ahead. Okay, hi. So I was wondering about the charging um, profile. Is each spike like one car getting charged? Yeah, that's a great question. So let me go back to that slide. So um, ultimately what you can see here is actually what we call like coincident loads where you have um, you know multiple cars show up and they, they happen to overlap either for the entire duration of their peak or for some partial, partial part of it. So really your, your worst case um, spikes in this graph, uh, you know, are looking at about, you know, 450 uh, KW. So in model three units, that would be, a, you know, um, about a little bit less than two model threes pulling peak power at once. Um, but, but really that's, that's not a single car. No, no car can pull that much power by itself. I think the, the Porsche Taycan, you might be able to pull like 270 KW or maybe 320 somewhere in that region. Um, so re really, it's, it's multiple cars stacking on top of each other. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good question. Hey, Quincy, just had a question on the uh, more of a sales side. It seems like this battery technology has a lot of different applications for different fields. Uh, what are you guys looking at outside of uh, car charging? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And, and I agree with your statement. Um, to be very candid, though, I, we're very, very, very focused on one core deliverable, and that is enabling the rapid and affordable conversion of the transportation sector's power supply to electricity. So we are very well aware of like very economically favorable monetization mechanisms in other energy storage marketplaces like frequency regulation that would where our battery would perform very well and we'd be able to distribute a lot of product. Um, but you know, those are things that we will go do, you know, five years down the line when we've kind of generated sufficient inertia on this specific problem. Um, it's super, super important for like corporate focus from a corporate focus standpoint to have like a core, you know, mission and, and vision and, 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 uh, objective set for your, your company. So, you know, that for us is really this, this problem in the fast charging space so that we can really enable um, e-mobility. You know, we, we view ourselves as a, a company that's going to solve the kind of the dirty and non-fun uh, part of the e-mobility rollout, which is the, the infrastructure side of things, um, ultimately by lowering the unit economic associated with charging your car and making, you know, um, charging stations ubiquitous. So definitely agree. You're very, very good point. And there are quite a lot of other applications like um, frequency regulation, which is a marketplace uh, that the grid operators provide that, you know, where they pay energy storage operators to stabilize at 60 Hertz for the grid by acting as a, a, a source and a shunt. Um, but, you know, we'll get there when we get there and, and really want to solve this problem first. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I have a question. 
you said that um, this battery solution can get rid of um, the need for battery cells that are associated with like this much power. Um, could you go into that a little bit more? Yeah, that's a really, really good question and a very important point. Um, so typically what people do, like the Tesla power pack, you know, Tesla's an amazing company, not knocking them at all. Um, I, I used to work for SpaceX, so I have a very high appreciation for the Elon Musk family of tech technology companies. Um, but what, what energy, storage, energy storage assets do typically, like the Tesla power pack, is they, they provide a power source from a, a wider spread of batteries because it limits the power load from an individual cell, limiting the thermal load ultimately. Um, you guys are probably familiar with your I squared R losses that turn into heat. That's a classic problem in electrical engineering, right? So if you limit the power from an individual cell, you limit the current, you lower your power heat generation to the, the squared root um, for a given fixed resistance. Like, and, and really that's how people solve this problem. They just spread the load over more cells. We simply just you know, use less cells, the, most, the minimal, minimalistic subset of battery cells, uh, and then cool them very well, rejecting the heat. And that means we can use less battery cells, in fact, six times less battery cells than our competitors to, so to source the same amount of power. Um, so that's really where our you know, major cost savings on our product line come from. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? From the students. So if not, Quincy, do you have more slides? Do you want? Yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll just finish it off with sure. two things. Um, we're hiring aggressively. We we have a unfortunately we filled out our intern class for this summer. Um, we have a lot of good students coming in from the U UW SFAE program, Oregon State's FSA FSAE program, and uh, MITs as well. Um, but we're, we're still hiring for full-time engineers, um, you know, folks that are graduating in the spring. I would love to, love to chat you and love to see your resume. So feel free to reach out. Um, you can reach us at all three of these locations. Um, and then the final thing, which hopefully is more inspiring is that um, I just wanna pass on to, to you all that, you know, I think the, the business leaders and certainly the technology leaders of the, 20, of the 21st century are all gonna be engineers. Um, I came from an engineering background. I was at SpaceX for seven years, um, you know, working on the Dragon, the, uh, the Dragon spacecraft, Falcon 9 rocket, the, the Starlink satellites, and the Gateway ground station antennas for the Starlink network. And in that role, I developed, you know, first principle engineering, um, you know, skill sets where I was, you know, able to view the world very mathematically and, and with a, an, eye, a, an eye of physics that allowed me to, you know, be a really good, be a good engineer, right? Be a good SpaceX engineer. Um, but it's, it's also very important for the folks on the call to know that those same skill sets are really the, the, the prerequisite requirements to, to create um, business entities in the 21st century because you know, the vast majority of new businesses are going to be technology-based and having you know, first principles engineering, pragmatism, sensibilities, and skills uh, allows you to view the world in, in and, and craft a business that a lot that you know can be monetized um, by ultimately creating product innovation at at you know the lowest possible level, and and really that's enabled by the engineering degree that you're getting right now. So, um, you know, even if you want to be an engineer and go into technology, which is also very very excellent, um, the work that you are doing right now is is, is really going to allow you to shape the future in very positive ways. So, just want to say, you know, keep up the hard work. I, I remember my engineering degree being very challenging, but I can say with absolute certainty that, um, you know, you're gonna be entering a workforce that has an, an incredible array of exciting engineering projects that will provide you ample opportunity to do meaning and, meaning and fulfilling work. I think Electric Air is one of those companies, but certainly there are many more. So keep up the great work and, and uh, you know, really, study hard and try to learn things at the first principles level and you'll be well situated going forward in your careers. Um, thank you all for your time. That's, that's the last slide I have and uh, really um, you know, appreciate you talking, uh, you know, getting the chance to talk to you all today. So good luck uh, and, and feel free to reach out if you wanna connect about Electric Air. Yeah, great, yeah, thanks Quincy. Uh, yeah, so if you have, you know, feel free to connect to Quincy or talk to me, I can connect you guys. All right, so you know, hopefully, 
Thanks, Quincy. So uh, we'll let you go and uh, we'll go on with the rest of the class. Hopefully you get some good outcomes. Yeah. All right. Take care, guys. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Okay. All right. Yeah. So hopefully that was a useful talk. Uh, no, so, uh, so I don't know what the exact battery technology is. So that I think that's, that's definitely something they're not uh, advertising yet. So, you know, if one of you end up working in that company, I would love to hear what exactly, you know, is in the battery. How do they achieve all those things? Uh, so, you know, so going forward, I think we'll try to have some more talks like this. Maybe not in this class, but in other classes, you know, definitely we'll try to have more talks like this. Uh, you know, one good thing about doing everything on Zoom is it's easy to get people to come over. So we'll have, a bunch of companies who's you know hiring fairly aggressively right now, and uh, so hopefully we'll get some more either this quarter or next quarter. Uh, any questions? Any comments? Do you think that this is useful from the class perspective? Okay. Yeah. So we'll try to get some, we'll try to get some more companies. So the I guess the broader context. Uh, that uh, electric vehicles, right, will be a, you know, electric vehicles and, and the energy in general will be a big driver for the next, say, five years at least. And if we do some back of the envelope calculations, our infrastructure and the, where we're trying to go in, in EVs is now close to each other. So yesterday I was talking to some utility engineers at Ellensburg, and what they're trying to do is basically on I 90, you have all these highway passes and you have big trucks. And uh, that sort of, you know, feel uh, one, one side or the other side. And they're trying to calculate how much the electric charging, if we're going to replace all the gas stations and all the trucks are electrical, and we're going to replace that, you know, how much infrastructure we have. And the ballpark number they came up with is 50 megawatts. Okay? Just to do charging for the trucks, forget about the cars. Don't charge all the trucks, you know, going on I-90, that's 50 megawatt. 50 megawatt is a good size tell. I'm not sure how per peak power is 50 megawatt. But their calculation is if all the trucks are electrical, that's the power we need to charge them. Right? So that seems to be out of the question to build infrastructure to that scale. Just the time it will take and the amount of money it will take is. I don't think we'll get there that fast. Then that leaves a lot of opportunities for you know, new ways to, new technology, new algorithms, even software, right? So how do you do all those things? I think uh, somebody asked a question about different sales. So if you look at this ion, there are basically a lot of work on cell balancing. How do you reduce the heat? How do you control degradation? So there's a lot of work in this space. Right? So if you're thinking about this space, uh, there's good opportunities out there. And it seems to be a space that's sort of growing quite fast. A lot of companies and uh, growing quite fast. Okay. Yeah, so I was send an email with more information in case you want to connect. So I sent an email with uh, more information about this company. And uh, for the guy, uh, for you guys who didn't catch uh, his email. But also this is recorded. So he can uh, just watch this once it's uploaded and figure out his contact information. Okay. All right, so this also has, you know, because we're, we're pushing those electric vehicles and other technologies so aggressively, there's also a lot of good opportunity going to be in utilities. Okay, so utilities, you know, for the last 40 years, the low growth is very steady, 1% a year, sometimes even flat, and that seems to be stopping. So if you're in a utility, you'll be facing with the fact that the entire business basically is changing. And how do, you, how do we deal with that? We have no idea. So there's a lot of uh, unknowns out there, but that's sort of exact, a pretty exciting time for us, okay? okay. So also, if you know any companies you want to see from a talk and uh, you know, you're a little bit hesitant to reach out to them, you can let me know, I can help reach out to them. 
right? Maybe easier for me to tell, you know, talk to this company to see if somebody who can come and give a talk. So that's definitely something I'm open to as well. Right? So if you if you know people or you'd be interested, but uh, you know you don't want to reach out and then I can definitely help. In that so this is so the hope is you know at least uh, in next quarter we'll have more of this kind of talks with different companies recruiting. <laughs> All right, okay. So let's go back to the class we've been doing. So let me. Open up the slides. Okay, so a reminder where we were last time. So last time we got to basically, if you look at a synchronous generator. So from a synchronous generator, what we said is if you plot the angle to power curve, right, it's something like this. So basically, this is E times V at the grid or X sine delta, where delta is your angle. And the peak is pi over two. So for stability, what we said was we should operate at this part. So this is stable. This is unstable. The reason one is stable and one is unstable is because, right? So basically what happens is you tend to move this way. Okay? You tend to move this way when you're operating on this curve. For example, if your load changes a little bit or if your generation changes a little bit, you're moving this way. And stability means that if you move far away, you tend to come back. So this is negative feedback on the left side of the curve. And uh, the right-hand side is positive feedback. Okay, so here, unstable means if there's a little bit of change, so this is negative. So if you move far away, you come back. Whereas on this side, if you move far away, you don't come back. Okay, so you keep on, basically, you keep rolling downhill. Okay, so that's a side you want to avoid operating on, right? So stability, this kind of stability concern, this is actually a lot of times the limiting condition for a grid. Okay, so stability. Stability is really what limits how the grid can operate. This is really the limiting factor. So again, a good example, a recent example is the Texas blackout, right? So what happened in Texas is they did emergency load shedding. So what emergency load shedding is, is if you're an operator, you basically cut power to some of your customers to reduce the load. And the reason the operators were, gonna, were doing emergency load shedding is actually to avoid instability in the system. So for them, they're detecting that the system is far, you know, is getting away from the stable equilibrium. And if they did not do emergency load shedding, their belief was that the system will be, you know, a few seconds away or 10, uh, you know, a few tens of seconds away from complete collapse. Okay, so what we had in Texas was not a complete blackout. Right. There was always part of the system that had power. So more as more of a rolling blackout, then they completely, you know, the whole entire system collapses. That's where, and the rolling blackout turns out it's sort of much better, much easier to recover from 
no, but it's like if the system completely just goes down. Okay, so if you if you really become unstable and then the entire system goes, then it's hard to recover from that. So one thing to think about is, right? So if we think about stability and recovering system, so why is it difficult to recover from a complete blackout? Right, so what you have in a lot of systems, you have rolling blackout. It's basically so sort of you rotate through different buses in the system. You cut power. One of you know, you sort of cycle through the system, cut power. Why is that different? You know, why is it that easier to offer than say the entire grid goes offline for an hour and you try to bring out the entire grid back online? Why is why is it more difficult if everything just goes down? A complete blackout is hard to restart a system from. But a rolling blackout is significantly easier. Does it have to do with how you need to restart generators? Like some you need to like let rest before you can restart them and some are right. just hard to black start? Yeah, so right. So the reason is not every generator can do a black start. So a so-called black start generator as a generator that can start without any external power sources. Okay, that's a generator. So if you have started a complete blackout, you need to start somewhere and there's generators, uh, you know, there's a special generator that can start that way. And the reason, you know, the thing is that a lot of generators actually cannot start on their own. So you have a hydro generator and that generator goes offline, not generating power. Basically to restart it, you have to open and close valves in that generator. That takes power, actually. That, that itself takes power, generate power. If you have cold power plants, often you have to you know, he, preheat something. So not many generators can do black start. And the generator that can do black start are paid extra amount of money for their capability. And those are the generators sort of, they are the uh, important assets in the system. But once the entire grid goes down, you have to start things very slowly. You start the black star generators, you preheat some of the, let's say, natural gas and coal plants, you open the valves in the hydro plants. So you have to do things in very sequential way, and that takes a long time. Right? So often when you see emergency load shedding, it's actually to keep stability so that a lot of generators stays online and we don't have to restart the system from scratch. So stability, so you know, before you may think how the main thing in the system is to make sure load equals to generation, the load balance. Actually, a lot of times the operation is the stability issue. It's actually the stability that's more important. It's not that if you have more supply than load, it always works. It's often we don't know how close we are to stability. And uh, for any of you who's you know to control courses. Stability in a power system is really a nonlinear problem. Okay, the power flow equations are nonlinear. We talk about stability, these are not linear. And for a large system, we're very far away from understanding sort of exactly how stable the system is. We don't have a good understanding yet. Okay, so that's also part of the challenge is uh, as things change, keep uh, as sort of more uncertainty coming to the system. We need to understand sort of better about stability. Okay, so this is for a single bus connect to, for a single machine connecting even the bus, as it's sort of clear we should operate where you should operate at, for a larger system become you know, less, much less clear. And this is something that we'll cover, for example, in graduate classes like uh, 554 or 552, where are we going to stability issues. So you can look at stability of induction generators and uh, it's pretty much the same thing. There is a max power, pull out power, and you should operate on the left-hand side of this. Okay, always operate on the left-hand side, not on the right-hand side of the max power. And you typically, you want to give yourself a little bit buffer. You want to give yourself a margin about how far away you can operate. Okay, so type two, type one, type three, the idea is the same. You want to operate to the left of the peak. You don't want to be too close to the peak and definitely not to the right of the peak. 
okay, for stability reasons. So if you look at stability, there's a notion of how stable, let's say your generator is. There is also a notion of how stable your system is, right? So if you're operating a wind turbine, you can think of, you know, as my turbine stable, right? That does the, no, you want to make sure the blade doesn't fly off your tower. So that's as my turbine stable. But there is also a notion of how stable your system is. You want to understand how stable your system is. And systems wise stability, uh, the idea behind it is quite similar to the stability of a synchronous machine. So what we have for system wide is if you have load larger than say generation, then the changing frequency is less than zero. Right? So frequency goes down. The reason that the frequency goes down is if you need more power, right? if you need provide more power to the load than you're actually generating, you borrow power from these rotating masses in the system, right? They're rotating, they have some frequency. You borrow this uh, power, so the frequency goes down because you're extracting power out of your sort of short-term storage that's in the form of rotating masses. So the frequency, they rotate slower, frequency goes down. So you have load less than generation, then the power has to go somewhere. So these are stored inside the, the these are stored in the rotating masses. So they speed up, right? They consume energy, they, they're taking the energy and they speed up. So this is system-wide stability. So a stable system, if you look at a, power system as a stable system is basically, you, know, you move around the 60 Hertz, but you eventually come back to it. So most of the time this would come back to 60 Hertz, but on a stable system, just that means your frequency either oscillates as larger and larger swings, or if, if your frequency you know, keeps on growing or keeps on dipping. So that's an unstable system. Any questions about frequency? Okay, so if you look at this picture, right? So you can ask the question, how does ERCOT, the Texas operator, know that their system is close to collapse? As is, you basically look at your frequency. You basically look at your frequency. And you look at how close your frequency is to 60 Hertz. If you see big oscillations, if you see big oscillations, then you know that the system is not doing too well. So the natural question is, does it matter where I measure my frequency at? For example, if you measure your frequency and I measure, say, the frequency uh, that's coming to my home, do we get the same value? Right? So as I measure frequency, look at stability. But there's many, many buses I can measure frequency at. Right? You can measure frequency from each wall socket. Will we get the same value? Does it matter where I measure my frequency from? I think the frequency should be the same. The phase might be different though. Right, so the phase will definitely be different because that's where power flow drives power flow. It turns out frequency will be quite close to each other. They will not be exactly the same, Okay, there'll be small differences in the frequency, but at least the trend and the weather is above or below 60 will be fairly close to each other. Because turns out frequency is so-called a global metric, right? So it's sort of this global metric. So frequency is actually in some sense the best uh, information we have. Because frequency is, this is measured everywhere. Right, so it's measured locally. Right, so you can take a oscilloscope and the measure frequency. We don't need the phase information. So this is locally very easy to measure. Uh, if not, you know, ten dollars oscilloscope will do a fairly good job at measuring this. But this gives us global information. And this gives us global information. This is quite rare. 
in engineering systems. Well, you have something that's basically you know, measurable in your entire system. And that carries say, this sort of net imbalance in supply and demand. This is quite rare. I mean, most engineering systems, it's hard to find this one number that identifies for this global imbalance. And in power, we have frequency. So when we say, you know, power system is very large, very complicated, but how does it work, right? Well, why is it, you know, even for today's power system, we have more than a million, no, not a million, 10, 10 million, 100 million something buses on the system. How, how do we get it to work? It's because frequency is quite a nice metric, right? So a single number you can, we all can measure as for the system naturally communicates to you physically through frequency about what's going on. Okay, so this is quite nice, quite nice uh, number to measure. So if you look at today's system, it's all designed around frequency, basically the notion that we have, you know, this frequency. But we can turn this around and think about it. So now if you are interested in say something like a microgrid, Right, where everything is solar and wind and batteries. So for example, the talk we heard earlier is about DC battery charging. Okay, so there's no AC, there's no frequency. So if you operate a microgrid, then what do you do? How do you think about this kind of imbalance? Right, so if we offer a microgrid where there's nothing AC, actually about the system. Okay, all we, let's say all we have is solar, wind, and batteries. Everything is DC or for on winds, you know, for wind, let's say we use type four. So this is you know, essentially, it's AC, but there's no rotating mass in wind. Do I have a microgrid? Any suggestions on what we do for a microgrid? We will still have energy imbalance. You still want to change your generation output, track the load. But then how do we how do we do that? Right? In an AC system, I measure one number frequency, and I'm done. For a microgrid, what do I do? Okay, so that's actually is an open question. Okay. So anybody knows what, what we do today for microgrid? So let's say you go out commercially and you say, okay, build me a microgrid. Now, of course, a microgrid has to be stable and operate. So what, how do you think it actually operates if you buy a microgrid? We have battery storage, right? But how do you indicate whether you need more power or need less power? For a traditional grid, you measure frequency. For a microgrid, how do you know? I'm, I'm a battery, I'm sitting there. So I'm, if I'm in your AC system, I see the frequency go down, I inject power because I know the system needs more power. In a DC system, you could just track the, like you track the DC voltage. Like if it's rising, you've got um, more energy than you need, et cetera. Uh, that... Turns out voltage is much more local. So voltage at each bus is not the same, right? Voltage at each bus can be, you can have a network where the voltage is all over the place. And so I, I, can, I can give you a network where the net power imbalance is zero but I can create voltage problem everywhere. It's not hard to do that. Right? So voltage turns out is not a very good global measure where frequency is, right? So the way we operate microgrids today is basically we'll engineer the pile electronics to mimic frequency. So even though they're not rotating machines, we'll program in, in memory to, for them to act like rotating machines. So we can have a notion of frequency. So we can have a notion of frequency to create this sort of global signal for things to work. So for example, things like droop control, you need a you know, you need to measure your frequency deviation. So we will program the parallelonics, convert the inverters to act like traditional machines. Okay, that's sort of the choice we'll make. Then if you've been listening to the seminars, uh, the colloquiums for this quarter, we heard a lot about you know, new designs using power electronics to go beyond this kind of thing. 
so really the open question here, you know, in microgrid, for example, or in a system with low inertia, as people say low inertia is bad, it's bad because we're doing this sort of frequency response to control. Okay, we adopt this rule. And then of course, if inertia goes down, this control rule doesn't work so well. But if you have a lot of electronics, nobody said this is the rule you have to use. Okay, you can use whatever rule you want. Who said you have to be like an AC generator? Okay, right? You have complete freedom in design, then as you know, unclear whether pretending to be an AC generator is optimal in any sense. Okay. So that's, that we don't know, that we don't know. So we've been, you know, the, we've been that's now pushing towards thinking, rethinking about if the system is purely power electronics or dominated by electronics, how do you go beyond frequency? You know, how do you create a signal that still is global in some sense, right? You can measure locally, but contains global information but maybe not so tied to being a frequency, maybe something else that does not need explicit communication that can still is carried by the physical network itself, but maybe not as constrained as frequency or forcing everybody to do frequency. Okay, so that's something to think about. Uh, I don't have a very good uh, solution of what that is, but that is certainly sort of the hardware is already there. That's a question of where the algorithm is. We, we don't have a good control algorithm. Okay. So we, if you're controlling, you know, if you want to control, that's an open question to think about. If I give you complete freedom in designing the system, what would you do besides pretending to be an AC generator? I can do something else between, beyond pretending to be AC generator, between a, pretending to be a synchronous generator. Okay. So that's something to think about. So, but going back to wind farm, since today we're still mostly uh, synchronous machines or a lot large part of synchronous machines. So if you're wind, you basically have the following question, right? If you look at this picture, basically if you short, if your load is larger than generation, today load is not going to reduce itself beyond some emergency control. Right? So if you don't want to emergency control, then you have to increase generation. Right. So a lot of generators, you don't offer it at your exactly 100% maximum. You leave some headroom. Okay, you leave some headroom you can offer it in to, cap, to give you some buffer in case a load is, you know, low growth, right? Give you some buffer to supply the extra energy you need, extra power you need to the system. So if you're one, there's a couple of ways to do it. Okay. If you're one, there's a couple of ways to do it. One is you basically offer, always offer it with a margin. Okay, one is you offer, it, you offer it with a margin. So one is when does you say you offer it at, uh, say for example, you offer it at 70% available power. Okay, so you know, So you know some max power you have, right? So your maximum power is determined by nature, again, right? by, by the kinetic energy in, in wind. But then you can always back off. You can operate at, you know, let's say 70% of your max. Okay? You can always back off at 30%. So this will give you hair loop, right? Because if the system calls on you to provide more power, you always can provide at least some more power. Then if we adopt this strategy, why is this particularly bad for things like wind or solar? Whereas this is not all that bad, or this is less bad for I say a conventional generator. Right? So if you're wind, you complain about being forced to offer like this. Whereas you, if you're a gas generator, you don't complain so much. So what's the difference between say a gas turbine and a wind turbine in this setting? Right, so, right, so Michael is correct. Gas costs money, right? 
So your gas turbine, you operate less power, you consume less fuel. So you, you know, you spend less money, right? So you don't make as much money, you operate less power, but you're also spending less money. So your profit, your net profit, is not necessarily all that much smaller. Whereas your wind, right, you're free, right? So you have a lot of opportunity cost. So operating at 70% and 100% costs you the same money because wind is essentially free. So you're basically losing this 30% of, uh, you know, the opportunity cost is much higher. Okay? You're, you're not consuming fuel. Once you build a tower and place, you want to squeeze as much out of it as possible. Okay, so you particularly wouldn't do not like this construction. Okay, this is saying you build one turbine and uh, you throw 30% of the money away. Okay, so this was a proposal, but not many, you know, some wind, wind operators uh, do not like this. Okay. So another, another proposal is to say when you can do the following. Okay. Another is basically to say that we will set a P max. Okay, we'll determine a Pmax. We'll agree ahead of time. This is the maximum you operate at. If your actual power is more than this Pmax, then you don't go about it. Okay, then you don't go about Pmax. If you're below Pmax for your actual power, then you operate, you know, then you generate the maximum power that you can generate. Okay. So this is another way and this one you know is one likes it more because in some sense you're getting a benefit right you're allowed to not hit your agreed upon p max if you can't hit it that's fine All right so in this part if you're actually less than p max that's okay right we we'll, we'll allow you to offer less than p max you exchange if you have more than p max you hold off on it and then use that as reserves for the system. Okay, so that's this is a, this is sort of I think more popular for wind, as we can get a number, agree on this number, and uh, I'm not penalized for not meeting it, and but then I, I have some reserves for the system, right? If if I'm if hap, wind happens to be large, and I'm operating at Pmax, so this is another way to offer reserves. And uh, you can think of many other ways to do this. So this is a ongoing topic in our system operators and FERC and all those regulators about what exactly should we do? Right? Should you, you know, do this? Should you do maximum power production agreements? Should you do something else? Okay, so this sort of good uh, debate, good debate about this. Okay. So then again, you know, you can be very, so then again, what you can do is, you know, you provide a lot less than what you think your maximum will be. But then here is what you do is you, you basically, you, know, you, you opt into the grid as a service. Okay, so you, you say, okay, I'm gonna give the grid operator full control of my one turbine, but then the grid operator can you know, be free to set up where they want me to operate at. And maybe exchange to a higher profit than being in the energy market. Okay. So here, the important thing is to remember that, you know, it's never supply just meeting demand at any one particular time, right? So you always need to think of, you know, we need some reserves in the system. And the question is, how do we get this type of reserves? Okay, so how do we sort of get enough reserves in our system? Right. Any questions for this? Okay, all right, so let's break now. So let's uh, take our break. So I'll come back at uh, 1.35. Okay, so I come back at 1.35, we'll look at some um, other integration issues when we pull things like wind and solar into the grid. Okay, so let's break for 10 minutes, we'll resume at uh, 1.35. Okay, let's get started again. So we're gonna talk about integration issues. Okay, so before uh, we get to sort of batteries and talking about how battery storage and wind come together. So let's first talk about 
integration issues that's faced by wind and twos, you know, a lot extend solar. But when you have variability, what do you do when you are in the grid? Okay. So you look at wind integration, basically, Again, the thing to remember is that the grid is never a steady state for this nice system that's unchanging. And so that's not what the grid is. Okay, the thing to remember the grid is something that's where a lot of things are going up. Okay, so there's faults, there's motor variations, there's frequency variation, there's everything that's going on in the grid. Okay, so. Now the fact that for most of the time the grid works you know, fairly reliably, that doesn't mean there's the grid as a boring system. Okay, so there's quite a number of things going on in the grid. So in context of wind, is what happens? Uh, the grid will have system disturbances all the time. Okay, there's disturbances in the system all the time. Now this can come from failures. Say a line just fails or a big load coming on and off the system, or something just like a lightning strike somewhere, somewhere in the system. Okay, so you know, grid has a lot of disturbances. And in the 80s, what happens is, wait, if you're a wind farm, if you see a disturbance on the grid, so that will show up to you basically as a voltage variation, a frequency or voltage variation. And then what you do as a wind, wind power plant is uh, just disconnect. Okay, so how you do is you simply disconnect and uh, you know, leave the grid alone and uh, you know, wait until the grid is working fine. And you'll come back. So this is the problem. Okay, so if you're, all you do is you're gonna disconnect when there are faults, when disturbance on the grid, this creates a big problem. Because you know what? What system operator really cares about when we're planning and we're operating the system is that the system works not when everything is going well, it's for when, when there are disturbances. And so that's sort of when you worry about when you plan and uh, when you do dispatch. Okay? So that's really where you worry about things. But then if you're, for a wind plant, all you do is there's something wrong in the grid, you're gonna disconnect. Then that doesn't help in planning or, or operation. Right, that really sort of doesn't help. Then what another thing happened is, well, another thing that wind tend to do is wind tend to cause Voltage issues. Okay, so as early, so this is all for thing type one and type two. What happened is they tend to sort of make the voltage fluctuate at the output of the stator. And then another question is, you no, know, because they're just you know coming on and offline, it's a hard question of you know what do you do? How do you build transmission? It's not clear. Because what happens if you're a wind power plant, your production, you know, is something like this, right? Very uh, variable. Then the question is, you know, how much transmission capacity do I build for this plant? Do I build to the peak? Do I build to the average? Do I build somewhere to the middle? So all of that wasn't clear. It was sort of hard to do at the early stage of wind power. So this is in the 80s and early 90s. Okay, so we have one at that time in the system, but mostly as you know, a curiosity at that time. It's okay, so we can generate some power from wind. But you know, if anything goes wrong, we're gonna disconnect them. And in planning, we're basically gonna assume they're not there. Okay, they're just, okay. So, but then in the 90s, Basically, we are we got better at building large wind power plants. Okay, we got we got much better at building large plants. 
Then when you build large plants, what you can do is you cannot ignore the ignore wind anymore. You cannot ignore wind anymore. You cannot when you plan when you do planning operations just pretend as if you know, the turbine is not there. You, you need to somehow take that into account when you analyze and plan for the system. Then the question is, we have one power plant, we have a conventional power plant. So in what sense are they the same and in what sense are they different? Right, so we need to account for one plant, but even today it's not too clear. You know, how are they, should we just treat them exactly as the same thing, right? They're just sources of energy and uh, we're going to, you know, not differentiate between sources that provide energy or should we take into account that there are distinct uh, features of wind and the conventional power? Okay, so that's uh, still to this day, not, uh, not exactly clear how we do this, right? But then the question, even at the 90s, there was a bunch of questions being asked. Okay. And the question is, is the natural question, right? And say, let's say if I build a wind farm, right? let's say I build a wind farm, then is this equal to a power plant? Right? The reason is if you build a wind farm, you're not just you know, finding land and building wind farm, right? You have to talk to the regulators say, okay, I'm gonna build a wind farm in your grid. Then the question everybody asks is, okay, should you be treated like a power plant? Should you not be treated like a power plant, right? So there are always questions, there are, right? There are sort of obvious questions. So is, is it dispatchable? Right, so one question is, so what's the answer to this question? Is it dispatchable, right? So when we talk about normal plants, we talk about economic dispatch, for example, how much is generated. Is one dispatchable? To what extent can you control one? Is one dispatchable? Is it completely not dispatchable? So it's not as dispatchable as a conventional power plant for sure. But is it completely undispatchable? Right? So you have yaw and pitch controls, right? I see the chat says. So is it dispatchable? This is at least we can dispatch downwards. So now compare one to a nuclear power plant. Nuclear power plant is firm, but it's not, you know, it doesn't ramp. Or sometimes it doesn't even ramp at all. At least wind is somewhat dispatchable, right? It doesn't dispatch upwards, but can go down. And uh, often you want to reduce the amount of power you have. So, you know, it's sort of like a plant, sort of not. Okay, so, so that's one question, right? One is another is, should we just treat it as negative load? Right, so is it, should we just pretend as negative load? Right, load is random. If you're a load, you don't tell the operator what we're gonna do. That's, it's their problem to figure out how to satisfy you. So should we just treat one as a negative load? No, that sometimes is, more negative than other times, right? Is it negative load? So that's one question people had, right? So if you build one power plant, maybe you should not get paid as a generator. Maybe you should go into the system as a negative load. And uh, we're much better at dealing with negative load than say variable generation in some sense, actually. So then, and then sort of still today, we're having the question of, now, how do we treat wind power, right? How should we? Okay, so to, today is not super clear. It's not super clear what exactly we should treat wind power as. 
when you're traveling paras. Right. So because if it's a negative load, then as a load, you don't do anything in the system. If the system has a blackout, it's not your job to help with the blackout. Right? Most, uh, so the question is, you know, does wind have to meet regulations? Right, so there is no regulation, not much regulation when you're load, but there's a lot of regulation from let's say FERC, if you're a generator. Question is, you know, should one power, how to what extent should one power meet regulations? So we had a bunch of questions. We had a bunch of questions you know, from the mid 1990s. And, uh, you know, people were debating about what should they do? So when do you think this got resolved? Or when do you think was the sort of first clear answer we got for these questions? When do we have questions if we look at the grid? Right, so sorry, when do we when do we make decisions if we have questions in the grid? Okay. Right, so we make decisions in the grid when things go wrong, basically. Okay, that's sort of the, that's the time where you got very good at deciding out, figuring out all those questions. So the code for wind energy in North America, right? So that was designed to answer some of these questions, right? How exactly should you treat wind and what regulation do you have to obey? So this code was initiated by American But AWEA, American Wind Energy Association, that's sort of not exactly important what the name is. After 2003, August blackout. So this is sort of the last big blackout in North America before the California wildfires last year and before the Texas blackout. So before these two sort of blackouts, the one we had was 2003 August blackout. This knocked out a lot of the East Coast power. I will not knock a lot of East Coast power. And when we have a blackout, then we're very motivated to decide these questions. They were very motivated. At that time, we have enough wind in the system People decided we should really code, right? We should really sort of come up with exact regulations that one power plant should satisfy. Okay, so before that, sort of random. You can be a load, a generator, or other things. But after that, basically FERC. Right, so anybody remember FERC? Anybody know what FERC stands for? If you work in the energy space, you'll be hearing a lot of this about this name FERC. Remember what this is? Right, so this is, as Chess says, this is a Federal Energy Regulation Commission. So this is the regulatory body that deal with electric grid. Okay. So, you know, a lot of lawsuits gets filed in FERC, a lot of standards is designed by FERC. Okay, so FERC, when he said in 20, 2004, adopted some of this code. Okay, so what this code says is, you're not exactly negative load for wind. Okay, what this code said is you have to do things in the system. You cannot pretend to be negative load. Okay, you have to do some of the things that's capable that, that's done by other conventional generators. And so one thing you have to do is this low voltage drive through. Which very often you see as LVRT. So we'll actually we'll cover low voltage drive through in a lot of detail. But what that means is if you see a dip of voltage in the grid, you cannot simply just disconnect and go offline. Because that's not that you should be able to rise through this low voltage. 
basically if the voltage is low, you should be still be able to be connected to the grid. You cannot simply disconnect yourself from the grid. You need to do reactive power supply. Okay, so that's for the basically type three, type four turbines. They mandated that uh, if you want power, you should do some reactive powers. You should provide some reactive power, it cannot be a big thing for active power. You need to have SCADA capabilities. So SCADA capability, this just means you being able to measure and communicate. Okay, you have to do this, right? So these are again, what's differentiate, you know, one from negative load, right? So often we think of one as negative load, but that's actually not what the standard, what the regulatory body has decided, right? So if you're aware of load, we don't have to do load voltage right through reactive power supply or SCADA, right? We, we don't have to measure our power and feed it back to the operator. But with, as a wind power plant, you have to do all those things. Okay? You have to do all those things. And that also explains you know, why type three, right? Sometimes type three and type four are now mandated by FERC. You have to do this kind of things, right? So this is what FERC decided. And then the sort of the main thing or the highlight says, you have to do low voltage rise. Through. You have to do low voltage rise through. Well, the word low voltage rise through means that the fall. So there is a, so POI is the point of uh, interconnect, let's say. And so it's the point where you're connecting to the grid. So if you're a wind farm, if you basically, if you're wind, you connect to the grid, this is the POI point to the grid. Then what low voltage rise through is saying the following. It says, if voltage at the POI is drops by 15%, then you must stay connected for at least nice cycles. You must stay at least connected for at least nice cycles. If you see a voltage dip, your reaction cannot be disconnect the blade. Then at 2007, it was a change type to POI dropping to zero per unit. So basically, basically, if even you're seeing a zero voltage at the output, so there's some sh short, there is a short circuit fault to ground, you have to stay on for nine cycles, right? So that was, you know, all the breaking resistance. That's what they're all doing, right? So you have, you know, for this amount of time, we should stay online and uh, we should uh, not be disconnected from the grid. So you have to ride this through. Right, this is called a low voltage right through. As if you're still generating power, then you have to be able to get rid of that power and the system must stay online. The system needs to stay online. Right, this is the low voltage right through. And then we have reactive power at 0.95 of nominal. So you cannot, you know, reactive power also rebounded to be this, and you need to supply SCADA data. So you cannot get disconnect and give them SCADA data. Any questions about this requirement of the code? Right, so this is the existing code. This is sort of fairly up-to-date code of what you have to do. So one question we can ask is, What's different than a between the wind turbine and the conventional generator? Does the conventional generator have to do low voltage drive through? Right, so if you read the literature, this is mostly talked about low voltage drive through is something for solar and wind. 
for a conventional generator, we typically don't talk about voltage rise, low voltage rise. Why is that? Right, so for conventional generator, definitely you should stay on lock. Uh, sort of not highlighting the code. Or else if you're renewable, so your number one issue has low voltage right through. You have to write through this. So what's different? Right, why is it not such a big issue for let's say a natural gas power plant? Right, so okay, so if you think of a traditional power plant, conventional power plant, what you have is those power plants are essentially voltage sources. Okay, your power plants are the voltage source that you have. Right, so those power plants are able to maintain their own voltage. Okay, so your gas power plant, you're very, you can, you know, you're a PV bus, so you can set your own voltage. So then sort of low voltage right through is less of a problem because you can start your own voltage. Or as if you're something like type three, right, the FIG turbine, then it's not trivial, right? If you use induction machine, it's not trivial to set your own voltage or you cannot set your own voltage. Then writing through is much less trivial. So this is similar to solar, right? Similar to solar. Where low, low voltage right through is important because you're not a, ideal voltage source, okay, you're not a voltage source, right? Your voltage depend on external factors. So that's similar to say a, a induction generator. So then, you're, then you have to think about how you rise through when the outside voltage is low. And if you can set your own voltage, then this is less of a problem. Okay? You just set your own voltage to be the one you want. But for things like induction generators, you're you may not be able to set your own voltage. Then you have to be able to rise through this for a certain amount of time. All right, so this is low voltage rise through. And uh, if you look at the grid operations, basically low voltage rise through, what, what uh, happens for them for that is, you basically have nice cycles that we need to, right? We have nice cycles. So nice cycles is a fairly short amount of time. Okay, nice cycles is a fairly short amount of time. And uh, the reason this is a fairly short amount of time is if you look at time scale for grid operations, the grid happens over many time scales, okay, over many, many time scales. So if you look at this, what the time scale the grid happens over is the following. I think this has been hours. So this is 24, zero to 24 hours during a day. Then the grid looks, you know, the power generation may look something like this, okay, fairly flat. Then if you zoom in, if you zoom in to this, right, so this is, let's say, this is seconds to minutes. What happens is you have a lot of small squiggly things like this. Okay, this is called the regulation time scale. This is called the regulation time scale. So remember earlier in the talk, they talk about frequency regulation. Right? This is a regulation scale. So any idea on where, where this comes from? Why is it if you zoom in, say, let's say to, you know, seconds to half a minute, you see this for squiggly lines. You see there's sort of up and down, up and down behavior. Any idea where this comes from? Right, so this comes from the small changes in generation and load. So this is sort of the short-term generation and load power imbalance. Okay, so this is fairly zero me. If you look at, so this, what I'm plotting, uh, this is, uh, yeah, you can think of this as system low, let's say. Okay, so this acts as system low. So you have this sort of second to minute for fast varying load. And this has to be balanced out somehow. Okay, so this is a regulation issue. 
Then if you zoom into this, right? So if you go to milliseconds, to seconds, then what you see is this sort of very fast changes. And this is the transients. So this is something like, oh, I closed a switch or I have a motor that's just starting. And, uh, you know, or, you know, there's a lighting strike somewhere on the line, things like that. So you'll see this sort of short time transients in grid operation. Then the rest is quite flat, right? So if you, you know, look in the hourly time scale, this is sort of quite, quite flat system. Okay? So there's many things going on here. And basically what the grid operator worries about, right? A lot of times in real time operations is this is low voltage rise through. Okay? So this is, can, I, can you provide, can you survive transients basically? Okay? Can you survive transient behavior? as a wind power, as a wind power plant, can survive this transient behavior. Then the second question they worry about is, can you provide regulation? Okay, can you do these things for us? Okay, so then of course, you know, you have weeks and daily is sort of much more, much less uh, variable, right? Much sort of much a uh, predictable patterns. So if you look at the grid operation, right, from the grid operation side, right, we, start, we talk about renewable integration, renewable integration all the time. So practically, what does that mean, right? When we say renewable integration, what things are we worried about? What things are we uh, thinking about when we integrate renewables? Right, the first one is basically transients. You have to survive the transients in the system. And we'll have more transients, not less, as we go forward, okay? Right, so we have more uncertainty. So this is, there's disturbances in the, the time of milliseconds. And can you survive this kind of things? Next is regulation, All right? So this is, Supply, demand, balance. In seconds, in the second to second time scale, right? Can you can you adapt to the second to second? So this really is for transient disturbance. This is mostly electronics. For wind turbines, right? This is really too fast for any mechanical device. So whether you survive this or not comes down to your electronics that you have. This is slower. So this you can do is pitch control. Yeah. Four, four or five seconds, 10 seconds, you can do is pitch control. This is sort of something that you can definitely work on. You can use sort of mechanical means. Then we have low following. This is for five to 10 minutes for a slower changing load, so a slower variation in load. This is pitch control. Right, this is pitch control and you know, different still pitch uh, how well mechanically you can control your turbine. And then we have scheduling. The scheduling is for longer term still. So this is basically we're going to address. So this is uh, last hours to days, and this is really not pitch control. This is prediction and algorithms. Uh, can you solve this car dispatch questions? Okay, so when you build a wind power plant, there are so many things going on. Right, so, and uh, you have to sort of make all of them work to successfully integrate into the system. So they're integrating into the system. And uh, we're actually sort of the most successful at a shorter time scale. Okay, so if you look at the success we've been having in system integration, we're fairly good at handling transient nowadays. 
Okay, so we'll cover that next class, but we're fairly good at you know, dealing with transient. We can do low voltage reactor in milliseconds. We have got into that part. We're okay with regulation. One can do some regulation, right? There are pitch control that can do regulation. So I think if you were at the talk, not this quarter, but last quarter by Lucy Powell, she would talk about something like pitch control in that in there. Okay. Low following, we're less good at. And then scheduling, we're not so good at. And so where sort of the success goes from top to bottom. Okay, so we're sort of the, in some sense, actually sort of the longer term, we're bad at. Whereas the milliseconds, we're good at. Because the milliseconds, really the variability in wind itself doesn't show up in the millisecond time scale. Okay, therefore, it's fairly, for, from wind's perspective, milliseconds is very fast. And this variability really shows up in the sort of minutes, hours, daily time scale. Okay, that's where the variability really shows up in wind. Okay. So if you look at transients problem, it's sort of a problem for the turbine design. You have to design better turbine. Whereas if you look at sort of the longer time scale questions, the integration, it's actually more of a system level question. It's not that just design a better turbine. Whatever turbine you design, you're limited by nature and the wind just changes, right? wind is uncertain. Okay. So there's, there's not, you know, there's different time scales and there's sort of different bottlenecks on integration. Right? So that's something to keep in mind. As where the variation in wind tends to show up. Okay. It doesn't show up in the very fast time scale. It doesn't show up in the sort of super long time scale, but in the minute hour day time scale when really the, where the variability shows up. And we're not you know, entirely successful or you know, even very successful at dealing with this. Okay. So I think, so we'll stop here today. We'll stop here today. Next class, we'll cover low voltage right because that's important. And that's sort of a, more of a solved problem, low voltage right through. So we'll go through that. Then we'll look at storage after that. We'll look at sort of more detail about storage design, how storage operations, and think about how storage can come into all these time scales, right? Basically, right? Storage has been talked about as a the perfect solution for all these problems. Right? You store power, you smooth everything out. That's not necessarily the case. So we'll take a look at the, how storage comes into play. But first we'll do low voltage right I will understand that. That's sort of a good success story. Then we'll move on to storage. Okay, so as a reminder, homework is out. It's a fairly short homework. Uh, I couldn't really come up with a bonus question that's doable or <laughs> that's sort of non-trivial, but doable. So this time we only have sort of four normal questions. Okay, so, right, then I will see you next Tuesday.